Noroc Timisoara. Makama Grab Bachmutov. And I'm here to talk about testing. Um, before we start talking, I have something important that I want to say. Our planet is in immediate danger. We are already blinking red, and if we don't do something immediately, none of us is going to survive very happily till we are old. We have to act today. It, it might be already too late to act, but we have to act today. So I'm changing my lifestyle, you know, less driving, one child, no flying. I'm trying to influence you to act, and I'm trying to vote. I'm trying to ask every politician, like, what's your stance on climate? It's, it's like my number one issue. And if that doesn't work, then like, we have to rebel. Because no one has a freaking plan, you know, what to do when that heat wave that we experienced in Europe this summer, what if it goes on for three weeks? Like all the crops will fail. What if a billion people decides to move because they have no water, right? What happens if the sea levels rise by one meter, five meters? Like there is no plan. The only plan is to stop it. As I was preparing the slides, my son, who is seven, asked like, Dad, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm working on slides. And when I showed them that you can search on Splash for background images. So of course, his mind was blown, and he found this airplane, and when he described it and he typed this text, I think they're learning this at school. So this airplane is blue like a policeman, number 576. And then, of course, every child is obsessed with pirates. So here's a pirate ship. It's, it has a lot of flags. It's attacking other ships. It's looking for treasure. And I kept this slide because I'm scared for myself a little bit, but I'm hundred times more scared for my son's life and what will happen to him and his generation. So here's my pledge to you. If you're working on nonprofit, educational, or commercial projects, and you're working towards solving the climate change problem, I will help you. I'll volunteer. I'll let, you know, help you write JavaScript. I'll help you test it better for free. Just come and talk to me. Uh, here's an example. I'm volunteering for this organization. They have like a web app where you can personally change your climate impact. <laughs> it's always uh, difficult to kind of change topics and go back to like, but, but, but we must. So let's talk about testing. Uh, testing is a drag, right? It slows you down. It takes time away from actually implementing features. Testing doesn't pay. It's like scaffolding, right? It's something that you build, but then you have to remove because it's not the building. And finally, testing is boring, honestly. It's a good thing that I'm before lunch. Otherwise, you just fall asleep. So in this presentation, I'll talk how I actually avoid testing, how I pick which tests to write, and finally, how I have fun writing tests. Uh, who am I? I have a bunch of projects on my personal websites, on GitHub. I mostly work in JavaScript, but I've used other languages extensively. Uh, I work at a small company called Cypress.io. We make pretty good test runner that's open source. My team is excellent. I code and code every day on features and prototypes. You can go check the test runner and give it a star. And finally, these slides will be on cypressslides.com. Um, I'm a wise owl, right? I don't just tweet, I hoot on Twitter. And here's why I write tests. Recently, I kind of looked back and I was like, I've been programming for almost 30 years. I learned first Turbo Pascal around when I was 12. And still, I, I doubt myself. Every time I write code, I know it's not going to work. Like, like, that's for sure. First couple times when I run it will be a mistake. So I constantly doubt myself. And I look pretty good doing this. So the simplest thing to solve this doubt is not to write tests. In the modern JavaScript, in a modern text editor, the simplest way for me to find the very obvious errors is to add a comment. 
add PS check. I'm adding a comment, and all of a sudden, my text editor, in this case VS Code, tells me, hey, you actually misspelled one of the variable names, like right here. It should be props, not props. It's such an easy change. So it's a linting tool. It's not a test, it's a lint. And there is also almost like a pyramid of linters. At the bottom, I put pretty. Pretty is not actually a linter, but it's a tool that consistently formats my code so it's more readable. And when code is more readable and consistently styled, it's easier to notice the obvious errors. ESLint is an actual linter. It actually understands your JavaScript code. It can find misspelled variables. It can find something that doesn't match the rules, something suspicious. The test runner Cypress was written in CoffeeScript, and the biggest, biggest frustration when I use CoffeeScript nowadays is that there is no good linter, like yes, lint for JavaScript. And on top of a pyramid, I have actual TS check. It's a linter that doesn't just understand JavaScript syntax, but understands the types. The best thing about this is that you don't have to use TypeScript to actually get the benefits from TS check. You can just write JavaScript. So here's how you do it. Step one, write your JavaScript. In this case, function add. And then you try to use, try to add two to foo. Step two, add comments using JSDoc format where you specify parameters and their types. In this case, number, number. And immediately you get a benefit in a modern text editor. You will get an IntelliSense. And IntelliSense will, every time you hover over, will tell you what the arguments to these functions are supposed to be. This was implemented in VS Code almost a year ago. It understands JSDoc uh, arguments. If you add add TS, TS check, then immediately it will tell you, you're using this JavaScript code wrong. You can even run TypeScript compiler without emitting anything on your JavaScript code to get error messages. No test, just quality. Which brings me to my biggest frustration, and I wanna to talk to each one of you, because you're not documenting your code. Right? The interesting thing is that open source projects have better documentation in line and code than closed source. It's so frustrating. Um, here's the TypeScript definitions we ship with Cypress. So whenever users write their test and they hover over command, they get this IntelliSense pop-up from JSDoc comments but tells him, here's what you're trying to do, here's the example, and here's a link to the full documentation. So just docs that don't replace all the docs. The actual docs are a lot more verbose, they're actually very, very extensive. But just have some inline documentation so that people who are trying to use your code understand how to use it. So I was thinking kind of about this. I have no numbers to back it up, but I was thinking, do I make more mistakes coding my code or using someone else's code? And I truly believe that I make more mistakes using someone else's code. That's why node modules is such a giant folder because we use a lot more third party code than our own code. So here's how it gets better, maybe. Imagine you write some code, but you don't provide any examples or examples are wrong or missing. Right now you're a one X developer. And then 10 of your friends or coworkers trip over, make mistakes using your code. Congratulations, you just became 10x developer with minus sign. You just slowed down 10 people. So I ask you, try to make your code simpler. Try to make sure that someone else can understand what, how to use your code without reading the source of it, without being super smart, knowing the whole system, just by reading the interface. And to do that, I think you need static type. I think linters help, just doc comments, and the green word for people in the back are examples, examples, examples. I love examples. That's how I understand how to use something. I just look at examples. People discuss testing pyramid because this is a testing talk. I'm supposed to have this pyramid, and, and, I, and I hate it. Like, I don't think it's useful at all. People argue about the definition. What's integration test? What's end-to-end -end test? What's regression test? Am I allowed to stop something if it's end-to-end -end test? I, look, I don't care. What I do say is that 
how to finish presentation in 60 milliseconds. <laughs> Okay. Okay, let's try going back. And I can change the screen. Okay, I think it was remote. Okay. Uh, everything is under control. Okay. So people argue about this all the time. I don't care. All I'm saying, there's code and there's test. There's API, there's test. There's web app, there's test. Try to understand a simple thing. There is only a thing you doubt works, and there is a test that tests the thing. So if your thing is a function, when you write a test, some people call it unit test, but I just call it a test. If it's a component, you have to write a test where you mount the component, and when you start interacting with component, and then the browser runs with your test. Component is there. Maybe you have an API. So you write a test where you call the API with some arguments, you get back result, maybe something else, and then you analyze the result. It's just a test, and then you run the test. Maybe you have a complete web application, right? In which case, you visit the site, you interact like a real user. It's just a test, and then the browser runs the test. But stop obsessing with names. If you doubt that your styles and CSS work, you add Visual diffing test where you add snapshot commands and then someone tries to change some SVG styles, but test detects it and says, your crust of your pizza that used to be yellow is now green. Is it what you wanted? And you say no. If you want accessibility, you inject X library and you run accessibility test. Like stop obsessing with names. We're trying to build a test runner, and then our users kind of build plugins. So we're trying to just allow you to write any type of test that you need without big problems. Excellent. Uh, two questions. What should I test? And how long should my test be? So let's start with what should I test? We can carefully collect all user stories. And then, once we collected them, we can write tests to match them. And that we can keep them up to date and in sync. So if we add more requirements, we write more tests. Or if we drop requirements, we update the tests. We're trying to keep them in sync manually. And here's an example. To do app might have a feature that the user should be able to add items through the interface. Maybe the user should be able to complete items and the user should be able to delete items. So we have three features. We can keep track of them manually by just naming our test to ma match the feature like this. Adds to do this, completes to do this, and then we look at the names and look, oh wait, none of the tests is named delete to do. So we write missing test. And it almost works, almost. But the thing is really hard. And it's hard because we're not doing anything one time. The whole computer science development is all about iteration. And once you iterate, well, writing first test is kind of easy. So two more tests are nice, but what happens then? You get hundreds of tests. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Like it's <laughs> um, so I think it's better to have some automated ways of keeping track if you're testing all the features. So um, some of the work I've done was how to keep track of uh, tested features using code coverage. So imagine you have feature A, so you start writing code for feature A. So you wrote some code, and then you implement second feature. So you wrote some more code, maybe you updated existing code, but the code is there. It now implements two features. And then you add third feature, implement more code. So now all these features are somehow implemented in that code. And then you start writing tests. So you wrote two tests, and then you implement code coverage where you actually instrument your code and keep track of which lines are executed when you run both tests. So in green, you might see that these lines of code were covered by both tests, right? And in red, are all the remaining lines of code that were not covered by both tests. And now you have to be a little bit of a detective 
look at the red lines and say, which feature is that? Oh, it's that feature. I have to implement this additional task he needs to do. This. And then you run all of them and you get green. And now you know that you're testing all the features together. So it's kind of indirect measurement, right? You're not really measuring feature to test. Instead, you say, well, all that code implements all the features. All my tests are covering the code, so they must be covering the feature. It doesn't mean that you get zero bugs. So people obsess about 100% code coverage. It, it means nothing, really. Because first of all, the code that you're covering, 100%, might be wrong code. So you're actually hitting completely wrong goal. And second, your tests that are hitting those lines might be unrealistic, right? They're not actually representative of the true data that the user might input, right? That will crash your code in production. So don't have this as a goal. Instead, let me show you what we can do. So we implemented a code coverage plugin. You instrument the code, but after that, we take care of the rest. So you run the end-to-end -end test, and then it will generate reports, and you will show it to you. So imagine end-to-end -end test that visit the site, find the input box, adds three items, and makes sure that there are three items in the list. End-to-end -end tests are extremely effective at covering a lot of source code in a single test. Now, I'm just going to ask maybe how much of a code in my, in my application do you think the single test covers? Um, anyone? Um, 40? Name a number down. Between 0 and 100. 55. 55 was the school number where I went to. So, yeah. Fun fact. <laughs> okay, more than 55. 75. Slightly under. 72. A single test, because it has to load the whole application, go through all initialization, render, react to events, add items, a single test reaches 72% uh, of your code. That's pretty good. But the best thing about this is that the code coverage is not the goal. It's a map. It's a guide how to get to that goal. So in this case, this test added three items and confirmed that there are three things in the list. And then you look at generate code coverage report, and you see something like this, where you see the code, all the source lines, and you will see that this part of the code, where you're actually handling in your, like Redux in this case, adding to do's, was executed three times because we added three items. So it's true. So we actually tested adding to do as a feature. All the lines in red are the lines not covered by the test. And all the yellow lines are the branches in the switch statement not covered by the test. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to test delete to do's, you know, complete to do's, edit, things like that. That's it. It becomes almost like here's what you have still to do. And so you write more tests, and you hit everything through end to end. Did they hit everything? I just missed this little, little, little box. It's 99.26%. So let's look at that two missing lines. In one of my switch statements, that's responsible for rendering the filters at the bottom, right? Which to-do item should I show? Should I show all to-dos, active or completed? That switch statement has default branch that says, hey, you passed invalid value. I'm just going to throw an error. Right? It's a nice defensive code. The interesting thing, I cannot reach that particular branch through end-to-end -end tests because my app is actually written correctly. It's wired so that only valid states are possible. So that particular line is unreachable. So in that case, we can write a different type of test. Don't go through UI, but instead, Take the source directly and just make sure that when you call that function with invalid value, you get back uh, an error. So you write something like this. Expect that call to throw an error. 
So the interesting thing about this, because it's not really end-to-end -end test, right? It doesn't load the website. You don't see anything in the UI. It just runs, passes, all the assertions are green, but you get back information because there is actually code coverage information even during unit tests. And our Cypress code coverage plugin shows that you actually hit just that line. That one test that was specifically targeted does reach that line. Great. And the best thing about that, if you run all the tests, the ones that load your website, the ones that just load that one function and confirm that it works, if you combine information from both sources, you actually get 100% code coverage. So here's my code coverage advice, because I'm tired of code coverage being used incorrectly. It should guide your test writing, not be a goal of itself. You should stop with build if a code coverage drops below a certain percentage. And it's not the absolute percentage. It just shows you that maybe the pull request of a new code doesn't have corresponding tests. If a code coverage drops suddenly, there's something wrong, right? Something that you should look at. It's very important to make sure that your whole team can discuss code coverage and see the results. So it's not the tool that you run by yourself. I think it's a nice tool when your continuous integration service runs the test, collects code coverage, and there are tools online as services where you, they just collect code coverage and they show that information really, really nicely. Second question that I wanna discuss is how, should, how long should my test be, right? Kind of like what Serpentine wrote. Most unit tests are very, very short. That's why you write a lot of them. Most tests that are specific to code have only three parts. They arrange something, like they, they set up data. They act, meaning they actually call your code and get back results. And then they have a single assertion to check if the result is correct. So if you look at first letters, it comes out as a battery A, A, A. So that's the, how they kind of call it. So why is that? Imagine how you run those unit tests. You usually run them from a terminal. If a test were long and something failed, it would be very hard to debug where it failed. So you write this short unit test where there is only one assertion. So when a test fails, you immediately know which you know, assertion failed, what is broken. So those short tests are actually short because it's hard to debug a failing unit test because it's a terminal. So I'm here with some good news. I kind of hope that you understand that end-to-end -end tests that kind of correspond to the user story are more effective, even at covering more code or truly representing what the user experiences. So I say write longer tests. Forget about it. Forget about unit tests a little bit for a second. Write longer tests. Just go ahead. No one will stop you. But you need good tools that support debugging a failing test. So in this case, I'm writing a test that writes a blog post and then comments on it. But the cool thing about our test runner is that you can go back to each command and see how the application looked and what each command did during the test. So even if a test fails somewhere in the middle, you will understand where it failed, how it behaved right before it failed, and what was going on. You can open DevTools and even look at additional information for each command. Like, what did the app send to the API? There is no more limitation of not being able to debug a failing test. So you don't have to keep your test short anymore. Unfortunately, every positive thing has a downside. So once you start writing long tests, you quickly find yourself with tests that's running for way too long. Everyone has their own preference or limit, right, on how long a test can be before you kind of lose patience and, I don't know, go get some coffee. For me, it's like 30 seconds. If a test is longer than 30 seconds, then it's like, it's way too long. Another downside to long tests is that if you run them on CI, the test can just crash because like your browser can run out of memory. So the long tests are a problem. 
So what can we do about it? Here's a ex typical example. I have some registration form that has three different pages. So I fill up first page, go to the second, fill the second page, go to the next one, and then I actually sign up and submit and things like that. So I kind of slow down typing here just to make it look worse, but it's a representative of a typical long user feature. So what can we do about this example? What can we do? If a test is too long, you can split it. Now, totally, it will still run for the same amount of time. But when you work with individual pages, each part will be much, much faster. So it's not enough to just split it into three tests, right? I mean, you have to go and fill each page before you can actually sign up on the last page. So here's what you do. Every test, when it finishes, kind of finishes with a checkpoint. Think a save in a game. You can, if you die later, you can respawn in that, at that checkpoint. So if each test ends with a checkpoint, then the next test can continue from the checkpoint. So how does this look in practice? Here's my application code. Inside the application, the only, in this case it's a React app, but the same can be done in any, every um, framework. So here's my app that fills that form right when it initializes. When it notices that it's running inside a Cypress container during testing, it will save its own reference with this pointer on a window. Now, this is important because by saving it, you give the test runner and your test access to that application instance from the test. And here's how we can use it. Our first test will only cover the first page on our multi-page registration form. It literally just fills all the fields one by one, then it clicks the button to go to the next page, and once it arrives there, it executes this line. It gets the window reference, and then gets the app reference that the app set, and then it calls state which gives it the whole Redux state of that application. Right? The whole thing but with all the fields, you know, uh, field, and the fact that it's on the second page. So it grabs it, and then it confirms that it's what it's expected to be. So I use deep equal, and I have my object that should be equal to that state. So I know my first page works. And now I look at the start of the second test. The first thing it does, after visiting the page, it grabs again the reference to the application, and then it takes it the same object that the first test finishes and sets the state. In a single command, you recreate that application exactly as if it were filling the first page and going to the second thing. And then you continue with your normal field. And here is me hovering over that command, and as soon as I execute set state, all the fields switch to the second page. Literally, there is no difference between me filling the first page going and me just setting the state to that second state. So it's almost like a relay race. Each test just starts from the first uh, result. But it's much faster to work now with each individual test. So, I'm almost at the time. I know you're all hungry. I know the first people already like left to get lunch, otherwise you'll get, go hungry. But I just have three things. Please document your code. Please start using linters. It's the easiest thing. If you don't want to set up complicated tests, just set up linter. You will catch some obvious errors. The code coverage by itself is a tool, not a goal. And finally, do not accept slow tests. There is no physical law in the universe that says a test must be slow or take three minutes. It, it's only the tools that they use that make it slow. Multimet from us, if you're angry, tweet at me. If you're happy, I have Cypress stickers. And if you're really happy, I can take selfie with you. So thank you. <laughs>